Biodiversity is a combination of the words biological and diversity, which refers to the variability of forms of life in a specific area. The word biological here is used as an adjective to describe the word diversity. When you say biological, it refers to something that has a life. And we say diversity, it refers to a collection of different things of the same kind. For example, here in the Philippines, we have bananas, but we don't only have one species of banana. We have tundan, binangay, we also have cavendish, we also have cats, but different kind of cats. We also have dogs with different kinds or species of dogs. So in short, biodiversity came from the shortened combination of the words biological and diversity. And it refers to the variability of forms of life in a specific area. In relation to this, Ecosystem biodiversity is a kind of biodiversity which refers to the number of ecosystems in a certain area. For example, there are a lot of ecosystems in the Philippines which will be tackled later on in this video. Since there might be a confusion on what is ecosystem biodiversity, let us define first what is ecosystem. Ecosystem refers to all living organisms interacting with its environment, which is non-living. When we say living organisms, it includes the three domains of life, the eukarya, bacteria, and archaea. And when we say non-living, it includes the air, water, land, or soil, and the heat coming from the sun, which has something to do with the temperature. Ecosystem can also be as vast as a whole forest, whereas dwarf fish is an accumulation of moss that gives an abode for plants, microscopic invertebrates, and bacteria. Saying that, biodiversity is significant to humans for a majority of reasons. For one, it provides many resources of chemical and biological products including food, fibers, and medicine. Another, it also brings about clean air, clean water, and fertile soil. With that, the purpose of this research is to delve into the rich ecosystem biodiversity of the Pearl of the Orient Sea, which is the Philippines. Moreover, looking at biodiversity at the ecosystem level is a way of valuing and assessing the innate richness of the Philippines, taking in consideration the striking ecological functions and interrelationship of both the living and non-living components of the biosphere in a given location, as well as the effects of natural phenomena and man-made environmental changes upon them. Obviously, the Philippines has a great variety of geographic features, from isolated islands enclosed by water to staggered mountain ranges and countless inland waters within them, thus making the country favorable for the existence of a lot of types of ecosystem. Within this country, topography diverges extensively from coastal wetlands to upland region watersheds. It means thus that the country is home to many kinds of ecosystem which can be classified according to their defining features. Start with terrestrial ecosystem. But what is the difference between the terrestrial ecosystem and aquatic ecosystem. Terrestrial ecosystems are differentiated from aquatic ecosystems because of its low availability of water and the reasonable significance of water as its limiting factor. It is also characterized by higher temperature changes on both a journal and seasonal basis than in aquatic ecosystems in the same climate because water has a high specific heat a high heat of vaporization 
and a high heat of fusion than the atmosphere, all of which can improve thermal inconstancy. Additionally, the available light is more in terrestrial ecosystems than in aquatic ecosystems because the atmosphere is extra transparent than water. Gases are more available in terrestrial ecosystems than in aquatic ecosystems. Those gases are carbon dioxide that function as a substrate for photosynthesis, oxygen that is a substrate in aerobic respiration, and nitrogen that is a substrate for nitrogen fixation. Terrestrial ecosystems are divided into a subterranean portion where most water and ions are drawn and an atmospheric portion where gases are garnered and where the physical energy of light is chemically changed into the organic energy of carbon-carbon bonds through the process of photosynthesis. Furthermore, terrestrial ecosystems are classified based on altitude ranging from sea level to 3,000 meters above sea level, presence of dominant forest species, endemic or native plants, amount of soil nutrients and moisture, type of soil minerals, and type of soil chemistry. In this video, we will discuss about the types of terrestrial ecosystems that is in the Philippines. We have mossy forest, montane forest, pine forest, lowland forest, forest over ultra basic soil, and beach forest. The first example of terrestrial ecosystem which is in the Philippines is mossy forest, also named as upper montane forest or cloud forest. It is known for its feature like having short trees with knotty trunks and branches. Its short trees can grow as high as 8 meters in protected areas, but only 2 to 3 meters on ridge tops. In the exposed steep windy places, shrubs with 1 meter height may be present. Mosses go tree trunks and branches while hanging in sheets, and the ground surfaces are covered by moss and leaf litter in a deep layer of humus. It usually occurs from about 1,700 meters elevation up to the highest peaks, but on some large mountains on Mindanao, mossy forest begins at 2,300 meters, and on some ridge tops on low mountains, mossy forest may be present as low as 1,000 meters. Podocarp conifers with low height but large girth with up to 2 meters diameter at breast height are found in some mossy forests. Conifer, myrtle, oak, and other trees are mostly common. And rhododendron often is common shrubs. Ants and termites are not present. And earthworms are abundant. Most trees have small leaf size ranging from 2 cm to 4 cm. Since this forest occurs high in the mountains, it is often on steep slopes and many areas are rocky. Rainfall typically exceeds 3 m per year and may reach 5 to 8 m in some years. Heavy fog is not uncommon. Daily high temperatures typically range from 15 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, but may be lower on the highest peaks. Frost is sometimes present on the highest peaks on Luzon during January and February. Another example of terrestrial ecosystem is montane forest. In the year 2008, Losso stated that montane forest does not only have a single family of trees. It has some conifers laurels, oaks, and myrtles, and many other families are common. The trees usually don't have buttresses and can reach 12 to 30 meters in height. In relation to the Philippines, Sanchez in the year 2017 said that this habitat expands from 700 meters up to 1,000 meters on small low-lying islands.
But on Luzon, it typically extends from about 900 meters up to about 1,600 meters. And on Mindanao, from 1,400 meters to as high as about 2,300 meters. Vines are common, with vines of the palm genus Trichinicha arborea greatly abundant. Peter plants, ferns and orchids, often grow on the tree. Some moss grow on tree trunks and exposed roots. Ferns and leaf litter lay on the top of the ground, and some humus is nearly always present. Ants and termites are almost absent, but earthworms are common. Rainfall in montane forests is typically 2 to 3 meters per year, and dry seasons are shorter and less severe than in the lowlands. Daily high temperature typically range from 21 to 26 degrees Celsius, with the annual average decreasing steadily with increasing elevation. Another example of terrestrial ecosystem in the Philippines is pine forest. In the year 2017, Sanchez explained that pine forest occurs on parts of Luzon and Mindoro where fires occur yearly up to about once every 20 years. Here we have an example, the Mount Pulag toward Ato. Pine forest is elevated from about 900 meters up to 2,500 meters, usually on rather steep slopes. Brooker, in the year 2014, observed that the understory of pine forest is almost pure grass in places where fires burn every few years, with no humus and little leaf litter. Bracken and other ferns can be found mostly in places with less frequent fires. And as fires occur still less frequently, small native woody plants begin to dominate the area. If no forest fires for several decades, broadleaf plants gradually continue the pattern of plant succession, leading to the return of the montane or mossy broadleaf forest that occurred originally with no further recruitment of young pines. So we have here another example of pine forest in the Halsima Highway of Binguet province in Luzon. The fourth example of terrestrial ecosystem is the lowland forest. In the year 2003, Butkin and Keller said that lowland forest is overwhelmed by types of the pericot family. These trees, for the most part, have huge buttresses and regularly soar past 40 meters or more in tallness. Figs of numerous species are frequently bound tools. And in the year 2017, Sanchez added also that this forest ranges from ocean level up to 700 meters on little low-lying islands and little secluded mountain ranges. However, may happen up to 1,500 meters on huge mountain runs on Mindanao and up to around 1,100 meters on Luzon. Little moss is available and little humus or leaf litter is available on the forest floor. Vines and epiphytes are reasonably common. Ants and termites are bouncers. Precipitation in lowland forest regularly runs from 2 to 2.5 meters for each year and frequently is occasional with an articulated dry period of a while. Temperature regularly arrives at day-by-day -day highs of 28 degrees Celsius to 32 degrees Celsius. The fifth example of terrestrial ecosystem is forest over ultra basic soil. In the year 2017, Sanchez said that in many dispersed places in the Philippines, there are rock units known as ophiolites that weather into soil that is known as ultra basic or ultra mafic. Here we have an example. On the left side, an altisol on pre weathered sediments from basalt in Silago, Southern Leyte, 
and on the right side, an opisol formed on three weathered sediments from basalt in Biliran Leyte. The soil in this type of ecosystem are plentiful in specific minerals, for example, nickel, magnesium, and iron. However, poor in others, for example, silica, potassium, calcium, and phosphorus. Since the latter minerals are fundamental supplements for some plants, places with ultra-basic soils will in general have sparse, slow-developing plants, and a considerable lot of the plant species are adjusted to these natural surroundings and are uncommon or missing somewhere else. More on the year 2008 added that any trees and bushes will in general have thick, rough leaves and the plants are frequently stunted once in a while, just a couple of meters tall. The ground vegetation regularly incorporates numerous types of ferns and some carnivorous plants, for example, pitcher plants and tanju. Little is known about the vertebrates that live in such places, yet apparently their thickness will in general be low. And probably a few types of warm-blooded creatures give off an impression of being limited to this natural surrounding. However, too little is known to be sure. Since these territories have fixation, at low thickness of surprising minerals, they are regularly focused for intensive and extensive mining. Our sixth example of terrestrial ecosystem is open grassland. In the year 2017, Sanchez stated that open grasslands occur in places that burn as often as possible. In certain spots at middle elevation on Luzon and Mindoro, particularly on steep slopes, Pine trees will develop sparsely in the open grasslands. In lowland areas, the grasses are typically sawgrass, particularly kogon and talahib. Here we have an example. The Masi forest covers much of Mount Pulag up to about 2,700 meters, above which is open grassland that is maintained by fire. So this is Mount Pulag in Binguet Province, Luzon. On the peak of the probably most noteworthy mountain, most strikingly Mount Pulag in the central cordillera of northern Luzon, fields above around 2,700 meters are made out of smaller dwarf, vine-like bamboo and grasses. Johnson in the year 2017 also added that there is frequently an abrupt boundary between mossy forest and grassland in such places, determined by the extent of fires in recent years. At the point when fire is stifled in grassland, wide leaf vegetation continuously returns, helped by different creatures, especially bats and birds that scatter seeds. Most open grassland is exceptionally inefficient for any agriculture purpose and gives living space for very few native animals. Our last example of terrestrial ecosystem is the beech forest. In the year 1998, Widman said that beech forest is most likely as significant as mangroves in filling in as a primary line of safeguard of human during strong winds and rampaging ocean waters in times of stormy climate. Some portion of the buffering capacity of beach forest is the filtering of flood water of the suspended soil particles before arriving at the ocean, thus preventing sedimentation of coastal waters that would kill coral reefs. In addition, in the year 1999, Hunter noted that before beach forests framed a continuum with mangroves on the offshore side and the landward dipterocarp forest on the landward side. 
they fill in as ecotone or transition between terrestrial and marine biotic communities. A few types of salt-tolerant plants are found in beech forests. Numerous species go through part of their life history or forage in beech forests. Two regular examples are the taboon fowl and the marine turtles, the two of which home on beech forests. Most Philippine beach forest has been lost to human improvement ventures, and huge numbers of our youngsters today don't have any thought of what they resembled. After discussing terrestrial ecosystem, let's go to aquatic ecosystem and let's discuss its first subtype, which is the freshwater ecosystem. So what is freshwater ecosystem? Freshwater ecosystems assume an essential biological job and give economically important products and services. They give basic living spaces to an enormous number of aquatic plants, fishes, reptiles, birds, and mammals. They have numerous migratory and threatened species of birds, reptiles, and fish. The freshwater ecosystems, according to Padua and his colleagues in the year 2011, are areas of tourist attraction by providing recreation sites for game and bird watching. Apart from this, freshwater ecosystems, especially vegetated wetlands, assume a significant role in mitigation against atmosphere inconstancy. They do as such through several of ecosystem capacity including flood control, water refinement, shoreline stabilization, and sequestration of carbon dioxide. At landscape level, wetlands control soil erosion and retain sediments and in so doing, concentrate nutrients in the wetland soil. They additionally give financial advantages such as freshwater fisheries, fuel wood, building material, medicinal products, honey and foliage for livestock and wildlife. Wetlands also provide fertile land for agriculture, mineral salt, sand and soil for making earthenware and building blocks. In the year 2012, Silan and his colleagues said that freshwater ecosystems in general are critical to poverty alleviation and creation of employment and wealth. Also, freshwater ecosystems give water to home and cultivate use and farm use and for power generation and industrial development. Their biodiversity underpins recreation, exercises, and travel industry. The freshwater ecosystem also controls stream and improve water quality through residue filtration and absorption of heavy metals and other harmful toxins. Wetlands ingest and store huge amount of water and flood water, consequently encouraging reviving of underground water. In the year 2009, Hector and Welby said that by energizing underground aquifer, the water table is raised, thus making groundwater accessible in springs and wells to help domestic, industrial, and agricultural activities. We have five types of freshwater ecosystem. We have lake, pond, river, stream, and marsh. The first example of a freshwater ecosystem is a lake. A lake is a waterway that is surrounded by land. There are great lakes on the planet. They are found on each continent and in each sort of environment. For example, in mountains and deserts or on fields and closed seizures. Here in the Philippines, we have Laguna de Bay, which is the largest lake in the Philippines and the third largest freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. We also have Lake Lana, which is situated just south of Marawi and is the second largest lake in the Philippines. Lake, or any generally enormous large body of gradually moving or standing water, that possesses an inland basin of considerable size. Temperature, light, and wind are three of the fundamental factors that influence the physical attributes of a lake. Temperature and light fluctuate from lake to lake. Depth, plant development, broke down materials, time of the day, season, and latitude would all be able to influence light's capacity to go through the lake's water. 
Light and wind influence the temperature in lakes. Sunlight warms the water and wind chills it off. Most lakes experience a procedure called thermal stratification. Thermal stratification refers to a lake's three principal layers, each with a different temperature change. A lake's shallowest layer is the epilimnion. Its center layer is the metalimnion or thermocline. And the most profound layer is the hypolimnion. The most significant chemicals in a lake are nitrogen and phosphorus. These chemicals permit nutrient-rich plants and algae growth to develop. Different living beings feed off these plants and algae growth, making a complex, healthy ecosystem. The chemistry of a lake is influenced by natural, geographical, and human procedures. The equalization of nutrients might be modified by biological phenomena. First, for example, algal blossoms. When algae growth recreates so quickly, it keeps any nutrients from coming to underneath the lake's surface. Another one, which is a common procedure. For example, the eruption of a nearby volcano can change the substance part of a lake by presenting new gases or minerals. Another, contamination. For example, the presentation of poisonous synthetic compounds from industry or farming can likewise influence a lake's chemistry. The measure of oxygen and pH level can also influence a lake's chemistry. A lake must have a solid measure of oxygen to support life. Lakes that need more oxygen to continue life are abiotic. The pH level is a chemical property of all substances. A substance pH level demonstrates whether it is an acid or a base. Substances with a pH of under 7 are acidic. Substances with a pH more noteworthy than 7 are basic. Lakes have diverse pH levels with life adjusting to various chemical environments. In addition to this, in the year 2012, Amoroso and his colleagues said that plants growing along the lake shore may incorporate mosses, ferns, reeds, rushes, and cattails. Different creatures live close to the lake, for example, bats, and semi-aquatic animals like mink, lizards, beavers, and turtles. These semi-aquatic animals need both water and land to survive. So, both the lake and the shore are important to them. Numerous sorts of water birds live on lakes or gather there to breed and raise their young. Ducks are the most widely recognized lake birds. Other incorporate swans, geese, loons, kingfishers, herons, and bald eagles. Numerous individuals think fish when they think lake. Probably the most widely recognized fish found in lakes are little shiners, sunfish, perch, bass, crappie, musky, wally, leg, trout, pike, eels, catfish, salmon, and sturgeon. A significant number of these give nutrients or nourishment to people. Another example of a freshwater ecosystem is a pond. A pond ecosystem alludes to the freshwater environment where there are networks of living beings reliant on one another with a common water condition for their nutrients and survival. Here in the Philippines, we have small aquaculture pond in eastern summer and we also have pond at Eden Valley Resort. Ponds are shallow bodies of water with 12 to 15 feet in which the sun beams can enter to the base, allowing the development of plants there. So the profundity of ponds are 12 to 15 feet. Based on the profundity of water, infiltration of light, and the kinds of plants and animals in the pond, the pond is partitioned into various zones. First is the littoral zone, which incorporates 
plentiful established vegetation, and various kinds of consumers as a result of its peripheral shallow water zone in which light can reach up to the base and it contains warm and oxygen-rich coursing water. Another is the limnitic zone, which is central piece of a pond up to where there is infiltration of effective light. It has related organisms like small crustaceans, rotifers, insects, and their larvae, and algae. Its water level, oxygen content, and temperature vary from time to time. Decomposers are practically missing here. Lastly, we have the profundo zone, which is a deep water region where there is no viable light infiltration. There, the microscopic plants and decomposers are available, so it is called hypolimnion. In addition to that, the thermal stratification of ponds alludes to an adjustment in the temperature at various depths in the ponds, and it is because of progress in water's density with temperature. Thermal variety impacts the aquatic life and prompts the stratification of the pond. There are three unique regions in the lake, which the pond also has. We have the epilimnion, thermocline, and hypolimnion. Epilimnion are the zone of progressively diminishing temperature from the surface, thermocline or quickly falling temperature, and the hypolimnion, which is the base zone where no temperature gradient is evident. Dissolved oxygen is the measure of oxygen required by microscopic organisms in the pond in a unit volume of water at a predefined time. It also alludes to the degree of free non-compound oxygen dissolved or present in water or some other fluid. It contains two principal segments, for example, abiotic and biotic. In the year 2008, Freeman also added that Abiotic substances of one biological system are framed because of the blend of some natural and inorganic materials. They have straightforwardly or by implication impact in aquatic organisms of the pond. These incorporate light, temperature, broke down oxygen, carbon dioxide, different gases, pH of water, turbidity, and disintegrated minerals. The biotic segments of pond ecosystem are the living parts, which comprise of producers, consumers, and decomposers. Another example, or the third example of freshwater ecosystem is river ecosystem. River ecosystem have streaming water that is generally unidirectional a condition of constant physical change, a wide range of and evolving microhabitats, variability in the flow rates of water, and plants and animals that have adjusted to live inside water flow conditions. Here in the Philippines, we have Hinatuan Enchanted River and Lubok River in Bohol. With this, the main factor that makes river ecology unique in relation to other water ecosystems is known as a lotic or flowing water system. The quality of water flow shifts from heavy rapids to slow backwaters. The speed of water additionally differs and is dependent upon chaotic turbulence. Flow can be influenced by an unexpected water contribution from downpour and groundwater. Water flow can adjust the state of riverbeds through erosion and sedimentation, making a variety of evolving natural surroundings. Also, the substrate, water temperature, oxygen, and bacteria are all important elements of river ecosystem. Additionally, 
algae are the most noteworthy wellspring of essential nourishment in many rivers or streams. Plants are best in slower currents. A few plants, for example, mosses, connect themselves to solid objects. A few plants are free-floating, for example, duckweed or water hyacinth. Others are established in regions of decreased currents where sediments is found. Water currents give oxygen and nutrients to plants. Plants shield animals from the currents and predators and give a food source. It is said by Johnson in the year 2017. Furthermore, invertebrates that have no spine or spinal segments like crayfish, snail, limpets, mollusks, and mussels are found in rivers. Countless invertebrates in the river system are insects. They can be found in pretty much every accessible, available habitat on the water surface, on and under stones, in or beneath the substrate or adrift the currents. Some stay away from high currents and flows by living in the substrate territory, while others have adjusted by living in the shielded downstream side of rocks. Invertebrates depend on the currents to bring them food and oxygen. They are the both consumers and prey in river systems. Also, in this kind of ecosystem, the capacity of fish to live in a river system relies upon their speed and span of that speed. It takes huge energy to swim against a current. This ability varies and is related to the area of habitat the fish may occupy in the river. Most fish will in general stay near the base, the banks, or behind obstacles swimming in the current just to feed or change area. A few animal groups never go into the current. Most river systems are regularly associated with other lotic systems like springs, wetlands, waterways, streams, and oceans. And many fish have life cycles that require stages in other systems. Fish are significant consumers and prey species. Lastly. Countless flying birds additionally possess river ecosystem. However, they are not attached to the water as fish and invest a portion of their energy in terrestrial belonging or from the land. This term is frequently used to depict plants and animals, which means they live on the land territories. Fish and water invertebrates are a significant food source for water feathered birds in a river ecosystem. Another example of freshwater ecosystem is a stream. A stream moves through a forest. Its unmistakable water surges over rocks and whirls into deep pools. The water looks and feels yet it isn't. It is home to numerous plants and animals. A lot progressively live along its banks. The plants, the animals, and the stream itself are all piece of a little ecosystem, a community of living and non-living things. Here in the Philippines, we have a stream at Hidden Valley. Additionally, fish, insects, birds, and other living things that are a piece of this community rely upon the stream and each other to survive. All aspects of the ecosystem have a task to carry out. Indeed, even the daylight that channels through the trees is significant. Furthermore, a stream is a home for water nursery and a nursery for useful insects. It gives water and carries daylight to plants. The living things in and around the stream rely upon the stream and they rely upon each other. The plants give nourishment to insects and different animals. A portion of the plant eaters become food for predators. Predators shelled the quantity of plant eaters from becoming excessively huge, so the plants are not at all eaten. Our last and fifth example of freshwater ecosystem is a marsh. In the year 2008, Moore, in his book entitled Wetlands, said that 
Marsh is a sort of wetland ecosystem described by inadequately depleted mineral soils and by vegetation dominated by grasses. The latter characteristic distinguishes a marsh from a swamp whose vegetation is ruled by trees. The quantity of plant species in marshes is not many compared with those that develop on well-watered, however, not waterlogged land. Grasses, grass-like sedges, and reeds or rushes are of major importance. Wild rice is of some commercial importance, yet true rice is without a doubt, by a wide margin, the most significant marsh plant and supplies a significant segment of the world's grain. Fibrous rooted grasses bind the mods together and further obstruct water flow, in this manner encouraging the spread of both the delta and the bug. Marshes occur in the deltas of the vast majority of the world's extraordinary river. In the Philippines, the Agusan Marsh Wildlife Sanctuary is an immense wetland of swamp, forest, water courses, and lakes covering a territory of almost 15,000 hectares. It is available through a one and a half hour motorized boat ride from the township of Gunawan, Agusan del Sur. The marsh is additionally important habitat for Philippine crocodiles and water birds. For example, types of wild ducks, herons, and egrets. It is additionally the shelter of the uncommon oriental darter and purple swamp hen, and the threatened Philippine hawk eagle, spotted imperial pigeon, and Rufus Lord Kingfisher. Another one is the Liguasan Marsh in South Focal, Mindanao. It is the biggest swamp and marsh territory on the island. It is a huge complex of river channels, little freshwater lakes and ponds, broad freshwater marshes, and arable land subject to occasional flooding in the basin of Mindanao River. A large portion of the territory is submerged during times of substantial precipitation. However, somewhere in the range of 140,000 hectares dry out during dry periods and are developed. Several threatened species have been recorded as it, including Philippine eagle. However, there is minimal recent data on their status there. Almost certainly, the moderately lowland forests right now support populations of more of the threatened and restricted range birds of the Mindanao and Eastern Visayas endemic bird area. The marsh is a significant wetland site and supports inhabitants or non-breeding populations of numerous water bird species including herons and egrets, rails, shorebirds, and ducks. These incorporate a Mindanao endemic subspecies of rails, Taki Baptus, Ruficoles Cotabato, and Calm Creek, Hakana Eridifara Galinasia, for which Liguasan is the only locality in the Philippines. Another subtype of aquatic ecosystem aside from freshwater ecosystem is the brackish or estuarine ecosystem. Brackish or estuarine ecosystem is found along the shoreline and extending seaward, found mostly in the mouths of rivers, classified based on dominant species or genera and coastal wetlands where sea water and fresh water mix that is according to Mighty and Mighty in the year 2011. The first example of a brackish or estuarine ecosystem is mangrove swamps. Mangrove swamps are coastal wetlands found in tropical and subtropical regions. They are characterized by halophytic or salt-loving trees, shrubs, and other plants growing in brackish to saline tidal waters. In the Philippines, we have Kandihai mangrove forest in Bohol, and we also have Banacon Island mangrove forest in Bohol again. These wetlands are often found in estuaries where fresh water meets salt water and are infamous for their impenetrable maze of woody vegetation. 
Mangrove trees dominate this wetland ecosystem due to their ability to survive in both salt and fresh water. In the year 2009, Kabangbang said that wide diversity of animals are found in mangrove swamps. Since these estuarine swamps are constantly replenished with nutrients transported by fresh water runoff from the land and flushed by the ebb and flow of the tide, they support a bursting population of bacteria and other decomposers and filter feeders. This ecosystem sustain billions of worms, protozoa, barnacles, oysters, and other invertebrates. These organisms in turn feed fish and shrimp which support wading birds, pelicans, and endangered crocodiles. Another subtype of aquatic ecosystem is saltwater or marine ecosystem. Saltwater ecosystem has a large salt composition compared to fresh water and covers nearly half of the earth. Because of tidal action, the flora, saltwater, or marine ecosystem are constantly changing. In the year 2008, they said that salt water or marine ecosystem has coastal marine wetlands and classified based on dominant species or taxa, physical features, and geography. The first example of a salt water or marine ecosystem is seagrass ecosystem. The seagrass ecosystem is defined as a unit of biological organization comprised of interacting biotic and abiotic components. It is comprising of aquatic flowering plants that can live in seawater. Here we have the seagrass ecosystem at Kanlangi to Bigon Bohol. Primarily, seagrass supports biodiversity by functioning as a food source for grazing and detritus feeding creatures. They can also be a nursery for young fish, cetaceans, and other reef organisms. In addition, seagrass is able to recycle nutrients from sediments back to the open sea while also functioning to stabilize sediments, ensuring the integrity of the seabed. As such, seagrass also functions as a buffer against waves or storm-related damage to its immediate vicinity, protecting the life forms that make it their natural habitat. Another is soft bottom ecosystem. Another type of aquatic or marine ecosystem or salt water ecosystem is the soft bottom ecosystem, which is an area where sediments have accumulated. Organic matter coming from plants and animals and other sources of nutrients settle at the bottom and become food for deposit feeders, bottom-dwelling fish, as well as for invertebrates, decomposers, and microbial life forms. Soft bottom ecosystem vary based on the size and grain of the sediment. Same with the majority of marine ecosystem in the Philippines, and sustainable fishing and aquaculture practices are the main threats to seagrass and soft bottom ecosystem. Worse yet, with majority of the attention for conservation efforts being concentrated on terrestrial, wetland, and coral reef ecosystems, these equally important and diversity-rich ecosystems tend to be overlooked. In the Philippines, soft bottom ecosystem can be found in Maragondon, Cavite. Another example of salt water or marine ecosystem is coral reef ecosystem. Whereas forests are a distinctive feature of the Philippines' terrestrial biodiversity, coral reefs give the country a likewise sterling reputation when it comes to aquatic ecosystem. Owing 5% of the world's total 617 square kilometers of coral reefs, the Philippines is a part of the world's coral triangle, 
Journey Indonesia, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, and Timor Leste as countries that bear the most extensive coral reef ecosystems in the world. In fact, Birdie Island in Batangas have been noted to be the center of the center of marine biodiversity in the world. That is according to Sanchez in the year 2017. Here in the picture, you can see a coral reef ecosystem in Bacalikasag Island, Bohol. Coral reefs are comprised of massive deposits of calcium carbonate that take centuries to produce and develop. Because of such a long process, coral reefs are very delicate ecosystems and are due to extensive protective measures. A recent example of damage occurred at the Tubataha Reef in the Sulu Sea in January 2013 where approximately 1,000 square meters of coral reef was damaged. That is according to Amoroso and his colleagues in the year 2012. These ecosystems are the natural habitat of fish species and other marine organisms where feeding, breeding, and spawning happens at incredibly productive levels. They also serve as natural breakwaters that protect coastal areas from waves and storms, facilitate coralline sand production that create remarkable white sand beaches that are a hit among tourists, and, it, and enable oxygen production through supporting photosynthetic algae. Coral reef damage is a serious concern. Here in the picture, you can see a slight pic on Tubataha Reef in Palawan. Our last ecosystem is a special ecosystem. This is an unexpected ecosystem that I will find during my research. It was cited by Sanchez in the year 2017. He said that this ecosystem has hollow spaces or cavities beneath the surface of the earth, often with one or several openings to the surface, and may be classified based on the nature of mineral deposits and geological formations. An example of this is cave ecosystem, as you probably learned in biology class, all life depends on sunlight, a process known as photosynthesis. This is true even for our deepest, darkest part of a cave, otherwise known as the dark zone. Here we have the Kalbiga or Langon Kubingo Cave in Samar and Monfort Bat Sanctuary in Island Garden City of Samar. We know that no green plants can grow in the dark zone. In relation to this, one way for food to get into a cave is through natural weather events like floods. Excess rainwater washes leaves, twigs, and plants into a cave, providing munches for insects and other animals. Another way that nutrients enter a cave is simply when animals like trogloxin and troglophiles bring it in. In addition, Yet another food source for cave organisms is one you probably haven't thought about, is guano. Guano is full of organic matter and troglobites love to feed on this stuff. It's the scientific term for bat poop. Imagine guano, bat poop. Bats nest deep inside the cave and their droppings will pile up several feet high and several feet wide. Very few animals can feed directly on these droppings, but bacteria and fungi found in the cave can decompose guano into basic food and nutrients. Ronca in the year 2020 also stated that all the different organisms in a cave depend on each other for survival. It is known as food chain and it works starting at the bottom organic material such as guano, other animal droppings, and washed-in plants provide a haven for fungus and microscopic bacteria which feed on the organic material, breaking it into simple nutrients. Then millipedes and tiny crustaceans feed on the fungus, bacteria, and the nutrients left behind. 
Bigger insects such as cave beetles feed on these millipedes, crustaceans, and even the eggs of cave crickets. Centipedes, cave spiders, salamanders, and cave fish feed on insects smaller than them. Some cave centipedes grow so large they've been spotted feasting on bots.